Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Good. It's a lot of feedback. Is that just me? Or... So this morning, um, you know, I, I've had plenty of time to prepare for this. Might be. Try this. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. There we go. Uh, it was rubbing. <laughs> So uh, I've had plenty of time to prepare for this, and I never could just kind of put my finger on what I wanted to say. And uh, much like everyone right now, uh, Montgomery County Fire um, is in a staff shortage. And so uh, part of our you know, we have a committee that's re recruitment and retention, and we look at what is what is our problems, what, are, what is causing issues, and then it kind of led us to looking at what's the issues across the board with the fire service. And the fire service is kind of gatekeeping you know they they pass a lot of judgment which is what i'm going to be speaking of today but it really led me to reflect um this judgment i'm a judgmental person i'm terribly judgmental um this mouth <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, right uh, but and, and uh, i'll read a quote here in a minute that really got me even further into reflection but i'm judgmental he went to uh, Jake's school for uh, the spooktac holiday spectacular. It was like fall festival, and I hate crowds. It's just the firemen in me. Like, there's way too many people for this building right now. And I just hate crowds. <laughs> anyway, but the other reason is because like people just are generally rude, and they just have no respect for anyone around them. They just don't, uh, you know, they don't care. And so just. I, I was at least raised with some manners, you know, I was a, a hoodlum, but at least I was raised to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, excuse me, all those things, and people just don't. Um, and so I find myself judging people very quickly, and but silently. Um, and so then yesterday we went to Evans Orchard, and it was so busy. And I watched people do some of the dumbest things. And in my head, I'm like, who raised you? Like, so... But judgment almost kept me out of Christianity. On the flip side, um, I started a lot of my uh, walk at a Gateway Christian Church. I've told you all this before uh, because of donuts. I love donuts to this day. Um, and when, once the donuts stopped, um, shortly thereafter, I did. Mom and dad weren't going. Um, I would get up on Sundays. Uh, my grandfather, Philip, um, and his wife, Susie, went every Sunday. They went early to Sunday school, and then we would sit through service. And I loved Gateway for a long time. But as I grew older and had, you know, became more self-conscious, I was a short, fat kid. Now I'm a tall, fat kid. But <laughs> back then, I didn't realize it. Um, but on Sunday mornings, um, there was also a huge disparity um, in income and, uh, you know, my clothes versus the nicer clothes some of the other kids are wearing. And when I was about six years old, uh, that started to come to life. And I would go into Sunday school and until the you know teacher arrived in the mornings, that was just a constant barrage of, you know, the short fat kid with his old clothes on. And so I just stopped going. You know, the donuts weren't there. Uh, so that was really the only anchor. And then, you know, the, the push was, you know, now the short fat kid. So and there was a period there where we didn't go anywhere. And then we went to uh, uh, Levy Road. Um, now I can't, I have it in my mind. Macedonia. Macedonia. Thank you, Macedonia Baptist. Um, and I went out there for a while. That was where I was baptized, saved and baptized. Um, and we did Bible relay. You may grow up with Bible relay. You know, they give you, they tell you the verse and you have to find it. And the first one will read it and you, you know, you get a treat. And that's how we learned the Bible and the books of the Bible because the quicker you were, and uh, I can remember we, we left for other reasons, but the day that I stopped enjoying Macedonia was when the teacher, I hadn't won any candy that day. I just hadn't. And uh, I loved to read, but I didn't love to read the Bible. You know, I was 12 years old, 13 years old. <coughs> what 13 year old picks up the Bible and just loves it, you know? Um, so I, I didn't really enjoy it, and so I never did. And I can remember the teacher saying, don't make fun of him. It's just because his parents don't make him do it. They just, they don't believe in making him do that. And I don't even think mom and dad know that ever happened. But the judgment that was passed on to my parents through me, I can, I can remember that to this day. 
Um, so there was, again, a period there. We went to church, but we didn't, you know, and then we left for other reasons. But in that lapse of when I wanted to go to church, when I didn't want to go, you know, especially for the kid who just got saved and baptized because he, you know, was excited about Jesus to have that letdown. Um, I, I had a girlfriend, lots of girlfriends, but this girlfriend in particular um, said, hey, after football practice, why don't you go to church with me? I said, okay, no big deal. Well, football practice is nasty and sweaty and, you know, you get a shower real quick and I'd just throw what I had on at school that day and I would go to church. And I was asked not to come back if I couldn't have the appropriate attire. And so once again, we still feel that way. <laughs> That's the man who pre preached in a John Prine t-shirt. <laughs> well, I'll get there. I'll, I'll get there. Uh, but, you know, that, again, that judgment, there was just a disillusionment for the church for years. And then we found Bethesda. <laughs> yeah. And, like I said, I can remember John, or John Prine t-shirts, and I can remember... Just look whatever, but like if you just look around, no one's dressed to the nines. We've got t-shirts, we've got, you know, all forms, people that have money, people that don't have money. It, it doesn't matter. We don't judge here. And, I, and there's, there's a lot of churches like that, I'm sure. But this one, I really felt that way. And I can remember even, you know, Paul preaching and there was never any judgment. You know, when, you, when you're raised Baptist, you get judged every time you step in the door. And, uh, Come in here and not have that. And to go downstairs, Rex and Janine uh, were my youth pastors, and they were just accepting. And they never judged. And so that won me over. Here I am. So, I mean, it. But if we think about it as a, as a congregation, as a whole, and we think about the way we judge people, when did it start? When did you... Start being judgmental. Can you put your finger on it? Well, so this this is the quote that got, really got me thinking. It was Ted Lasso. Has anybody ever watched Ted Lasso? The only reason I watch it, I, I hate Apple and Apple phones and all that stuff. I'm just not a big Apple fan, and so I don't have Apple TV. But a couple guys at work, they're elitist Apple. So they have <laughs> Apple TV. And uh, they watch this show, and it's actually a really good show. But this quote came up, and I'll read it to you. It says, Guys have underestimated me my entire life. And for years, I never understood why. He used to really bother me. But then one day, I was driving by, or driving my little boy to school, and I saw this quote by Walt Whitman. And it was painted on the wall there, and it said, Be curious, not judgmental. I like that. He said, So I get back in my car, and I'm driving to work, and all of a sudden, it hits me. All them fellas that used to belittle me, not a single one of them were. You know, they thought they had everything figured out. So they judged everything. They judged me. They judged everyone. And I realized that that was why they were underestimating me. It had nothing to do with who I was. They lost their curiosity. So think about that. God says to come to him as a little child. And children are full of curiosity. We'll get, you know, I've got, I've always wanted to teach my curiosity lesson I've taught downstairs because, you know, how, how do you introduce that? But, but here it is. It's, when did we stop becoming curious? When did we stop asking questions? When did we start saying, I know the Bible, instead of questioning what the Bible means and what each word says? I'll tell you, translations are a huge thing. You know, just from one translation to the next, then why does this translation say it this way and this one say it another way? And you can just build this relationship with God just through the curiosity of figuring out the Bible and why it's written the way it is. So when I was downstairs, um, one of my big things, like you just, after a while, you just hit a brick wall and you're like, what more can I teach these kids? Especially, I don't have the little kids. You know, those are easy. You can sing songs and do crafts and they're completely okay with that. And then you get... To the middle age, that disillusionment stage was like, I don't want to do play Fortnite. <laughs> but you get there and it's like, well, how do I draw them in? And so I always ask, well, what do you want to know? And 
he's not here today and they, they have been through COVID, but one of the boys said, were unicorns and dragons real? But who here believes in giants, unicorns, and dragons? A couple. <laughs> That's okay. So, were they real? So we'll start with the easy one, giants. Giants are easy. So Genesis 6, 4, get back there. Genesis 6, 4 says, then the Nephilim, if you go to King James, said in the, those days there were giants in the field. And they were on earth in both those days and afterwards when the sons of God came to the daughters of man who bore children to them. They were the powerful men of old, famous men, giants. Numbers 13, 30 through 33 says, find it here. Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, let's go up now and take possessions of the land because we can certainly conquer it. But the men who had gone up with them responded, we can't attack the people because they are stronger than we. So they gave a negative report to the Israelites about the land they had scouted. This pastor to explore is the one that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are men of great size. We even saw the Nephilim, the giants, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. To ourselves, we seem like grasshoppers. We must have seemed the same to them. Men so big, they felt like grasshoppers. So how can you really say there were no giants? I mean, I can get, I watched the whole Discovery Channel, is there giant thing, and I'm not, I'm on the fence. <laughs> I can go either way, man. They've got some good stuff. Were they really hidden, were they not? I'm not going to get into it because I've, I've driven myself crazy over it. <laughs> were there giants? So then there's unicorns. What about unicorns? Nine times in the King James Version, unicorns are mentioned. Now, I didn't know that because who here reads King James? I can't still. I mean, I can, but it's hard. Some of those words are not my lexicon. It's just not there. <laughs> but Numbers 23, 22 is one of them. And it says, God brought them out of Egypt. He is like the horn of the wild unicorn for them. Then Job 39, 9. I'm just going to jump through these real quick. Job is one of my favorite. He has all the mythological creatures right there together. <laughs> it says, would the unicorn be willing to serve you? Would it spend the night by your feeding trough? Can you hold the unicorn to a fertile by its harness? Will it plow the valleys behind you? Can you depend on it because its strength is great? Can you trust the unicorn to harvest your grain and bring it to your threshing floor? Unicorns. And dragons. 21 times in the Old Testament alone. Now, it's not just dragons. You know, dragons are a metaphor for a lot of things, for evil and things like that. But when they go into description, is it dragons? Is it dinosaurs? What is it? So, Job 40, 15 through 24 says, Look at Behemoth. And depending on which translation, it'll say, Look at the dragon, look at Leviathan. Behemoth is a big one. It says, which I made along with you. He eats grass like cattle. Look at the strength of his back and the power in his muscles of his belly. His tail is like that of a cedar tree. His tendons of his thighs are woven together. His bones are bronze tubes and his limbs like iron rods. He is the foremost of God's work. And over in Job 41, 12, it says, I cannot be silent about his limbs, his power, his proportions. Who can strip off his outer covering? Who can penetrate his double layer of armor, his jaw surrounded by those terrifying teeth, his pride and his rows of scales closely sealed together, one scale so close to another that no air can pass between them. They are drawn, joined to one another so closely connected they cannot be separated. He's, his snorting flashes with light while his eyes are like the rays of dawn. Flaming torches shoot from his mouth, fiery sparks fly out, smoke billows from his nostrils, that's from a boiling pot of burning reeds. His breath set coals ablaze and flames pour from his mouth. Strength resides in his neck and dismay dances before him. Dragons. And I, when I learned that and when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. <laughs> and 
and my curiosity was sparked, and I was like, what more questions do you guys have? Because like, I've been learning so much. <laughs> and that, you know, I can say that with that lesson, really changed the way that I started looking at the Bible. But now, I'm, I'm curious, so I started asking questions. So here, I'm, I need some feedback here. The neck of the horse, feet and legs of an ox, the head of a camel, reddish in color, with white spots. What animal is it? Say it again. One more time, one more time. The neck of a horse, the feet and legs of an ox, the head of a camel, reddish in color, with white spots. What's that? Giraffe. Giraffe, who's that? Look at her. That is Pliny the Elder's description of the giraffe. So here's another one. Shaped like a boar, two girdles on his body like the wings of a dragon, skin covered in scales like the shell of a tortoise. A rhinoceros, of all things, a rhinoceros, right? So, you know, King James Version was, you know, coming out and was uh, translated uh, from Latin. Around the same time, some of these, Pliny the Elder was actually coming through his bestiary. So it's easy to see where the correlation comes in, but the fact that that happened, and it, it's just wild to me that the little things like that can spark our curiosity. And so I, I, curious means eager to know or to learn, but it also means strange or unusual. And so we're called to be curious. We're called to be eager to know, to learn, to Find new things. I mean, think about all the curiosities of the world. Electricity. Who here can say, I know exactly why electricity is and how it works? Because I can't. If I flip a light on and there's a light that comes on, that's magic to me. Right? You know, I can, I can tell you all about fire. I can do that because, you know, that's what I do. I'm, I'm fire. I can tell you how uh, medicines work and why they work down to the cellular level. I can do that. But electricity just blows my mind. How am I getting Wi-Fi to my phone right now? Well, I, I'm getting there. I hear this. I got uh, four bars. We're good. So how is that happening? But the thing is, the curiosities of men that was given to us by God led to these great and amazing things. I mean, we went from, in less than 2,000 years, you know, walking with nothing but thong sandals to having LeBron James, you know, Nike tennis shoes that we can buy every day of the week. You know, we had, you know, I'm, I'm going to say the Amish can put a house up in a day, but, you know, it used to be that it took villages weeks to, to build their village, and today we can build, you know, a McDonald's in two weeks. All because of curiosity, because we were curious, because we wanted to know how things work and, and build and grow. Why aren't we that way with the Bible? Why aren't we that way with God? We are nothing but his imagination. He thought of us. He created us in his mind and then spoke it into being. Everything that are, is, and was, and will be is nothing but God's curiosity, his imagination. His... And he made us like him. So can you say when you lost your curiosity. When did we stop asking questions? Who here said when they were eight years old, I want to be an accountant? Now, before I go any further, I'm not downing being an accountant. <laughs> I promise you. But I can, like, I love math and I have fun with math, but I cannot imagine being just an accountant. The numbers aren't that exciting to me. You know, who, like, well, teachers, I've got a lot of teachers here. When did you say, I no longer want to be a superhero, or I no longer want to be something, you know, I no longer want to be a unicorn tamer, and I want to be a teacher. Do you remember? <laughs> life kicks in. I mean, that's what, that's what it is. And we get so caught up in life, in bills, in do I go to college? We get so caught up in how am I going to raise a family? We get so caught up in, I gotta buy a car so that I can go to work, but I gotta have money to buy the car, so I gotta have a job, and then I gotta get, have a job to get gas. And it, we get so weighed down in life. 
that our curiosity just fades. Don't stop asking those questions. Find something that sparks your curiosity. Now, I said it's eager to know or learn, but it's also strange and unusual. We were called to be the salt of the earth. Now, that doesn't mean that we were called to be white, you know, and bland. That's not what salt is. Salt enhances flavor. Salt spices things up. I'll tell you, one of the spiciest people I know on this earth is T.J. Taylor. <laughs> TJ from a young age you would just look at him and he is just full of energy and knowledge about nothing and something to say about everything and I can remember when he was real little some of the things he would come off with and just the craziest things you know he's allergic to dairy but he really likes dairy like not just like lactose intolerant like stop breathing and I can remember just asking the question, why are you eating that pizza? You know you're allergic to dairy. I don't know. I just want to know what it tastes like. <laughs> he knew he couldn't eat cheese, but he was so curious that he was willing to risk his own life to see what pizza, pizza tasted like. <laughs> TJ is spicy, and he taught me a lot. Because no matter what people say or think about it, no wonder... No matter how they look at him, TJ is always spicy. He's exuberant. He just exudes this energy that I can never match. And it made me kind of look at how I was in life. Now, was I spicy? Because if we just come in here and we're bland, I mean, who wants to come in here and listen to, you know, the same old hymnal? Some people want that. There's plenty of Baptist churches all over the South that get upset if you sing anything other than the morning hymnal. Ashley's home church. You go in, you open the book, everybody stands up, it's acapella, and if it's anything other, it's, no one goes for it. They won't go outside of it. And to me, that's just bland. You know, I grew up, you know, in churches that way, and then I came here, and I guess this church has spoiled me because I can remember the days of John and Stacy and Gene and everybody up here, and we would rock this place, and the roof would come off. I mean, I remember those days, and I could come in here excited. And then Paul would teach this exciting message because I'd never looked at it in that way, in that perspective before. But are we really being spicy enough? Are we really being enough salt to wet the taste buds of those who don't know Christ? When you go out of here, are you... Curious? Do people look at you and say, well, what's up with them? Why are they smiling all the time? Why? Because I leave here, and for the most part, I'm just full of joy. You know, I, I found God, and I even in the, I go into some of the worst, most horrible situations, and I can laugh and joke about it, because I just have the joy of knowing that God blessed me enough to be there. I smile a lot, and people, you know... It, People ask questions. So be curious. Be strange. Be curious. Question everything. Not be judgmental. Let's move past this I know everything. Let's move past I know God and you know I know the Bible and I know what it says and I know what it means. Let's move past. When you go out of here today, I want you to go out of here today and be curious. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you gave us our imagination, that you gave us curiosity. You gave us our curiosity so that we could learn and grow and grow in you, Lord. We just, we just ask that you will renew and spark that curiosity again. We ask that when we leave here today, we pick up our Bibles and we look at it in a brand new way and Start asking questions about the whys and the how. Lord, we ask that you make us the salt, that you make us spicy, Lord, when we leave here. We want people to ask why we're so happy. We want ask people to ask why we are the way we are so that we can turn it on to you. Lord, I just ask that you bless each one of us as we go out of here today and keep us safe until we can come back again next week. And it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go be spicy.